Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber. When I'm not interviewing world-class guitar players, I'm busy helping clients with their marketing. In fact, since March of 2000, I've helped over 300 clients in 108 different industries all over the world sell everything from $20 books to $5,000 seminar seats and everything in between. I even authored a marketing book called How to Make Maximum Money with Minimum Customers. And now I'm giving away a free marketing strategy session to business owners who qualify. On this call, we'll discuss what's currently working in your business, specific sales and marketing problems you're struggling with, and I'll identify specific strategies you can use to overcome these problems and increase your cash flow. To find out if you qualify and to book your free marketing strategy session with me, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing right now. Again, to book your free marketing strategy session with me, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing right now. Thanks for listening. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. We're here with a rocking guitar player today. We're here with Kurt McKim, who played with uh, Pat Travers and a bunch of other cool bands. Uh, he was born in Pasadena, Texas. He started playing guitar at age 14 during the height of the 70s hard rockers. He played steadily around the Houston and Southeast Texas regions, and when he was there, he met Mark May from Dickie Betts and Great Southern, and he played second guitar in Mark's band, and they actually toured and opened for the Allman Brothers in the summer of 97 and 98, and we'll talk about that. In 98, Kurt felt they needed a change, and he happened to get a call from someone in Nashville to come over to Nashville and work with some upstart acts. He played radio tours with Country Music Association nominated artists Julie Reeves and Redmond Vale. In the early 2000s, Kirk moved to L.A., and he worked with Ken Carman and Rick Garcia, two top composers and music editors in Hollywood. In 2005, he got a call from Pat Travers, who he had met at a gig in Florida, and Pat's from Florida. He made the jump and joined the band. They recorded three records with the Pat Travers band, Stick With What You Know, live in 2006, Fidelis in 2008, and Can Do in May of 2013. In August of 2015, Kirk joined uh, Billy Bob Thornton's The Box Masters as a touring and recording guitarist. He also has a three-piece rock band called Through the Noise, and he recently relocated to the Orlando area right down the road on I-4 from me. Kirk, thanks for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show, brother. Hey, man. Thank you for having me, man. It's good to be here. Hey, so what was your experience like opening up for the Allman Brothers? And I was curious if there were any like lessons or stuff you might have learned from those guys. Uh, it was great. Um, I, I just got with Mark and we, uh, he was like, I guess like his guitar player at the time didn't want to go do the tour uh, for some reason. And, um, anyway, he called me and, uh, we, we went on that deal and it was great. Uh, it was so funny because I was thinking about that on the way over here and, um, just, uh, Man, what a what a great experience that is! Dicky was real good to us, and um, it was funny because the first gig was in Birmingham, Alabama, and Kirk West is their tour manager, and he brought us backstage. He goes, he goes, you know, I got two guys. I'm trying to keep sober on this in this band. He goes, so if you guys bring any alcohol whatsoever, you're all you're kicked the fuck out of here. You know, you're gone. <laughs> you know? So I was like, you're gone. And so like, we were like, we had it, but we just kept it real under wraps and stuff. But, um, but it was cool, man. Dickie was uh, real good to us, like I said. And uh, we, we uh, you know, we'd play, we'd open up for him, and, and like nobody had heard of us. And I'd be looking out in the crowd, you know, it's like these big uh, sheds, you know, like, you know, you know, these big, you know, 15,000 seat deals or whatever. And I'd be looking at people and they're look, <laughs> looking, looking at each other going like, who the fuck are these guys? You know, what the fuck, what the fuck is this? And then, uh, and I'm like, oh man, okay, but we're still just playing, you know, chugging along. And, and Dickie would come out on stage with us and play. Oh, sometimes. wow. So that really it, probably turned yeah. the corner. It did. And it was like, okay, you're initiated now, you know, <laughs> it's like, so he would always, you know, he, when he felt like we were, you know, bombing or, or, you know, people weren't really getting into it, you know, I mean, because these are big crowds, and they're just kind of like these lukewarm reactions. Then Dickie comes out, and it's like, like they're just like into us the whole time. The rest of the, <laughs> the rest 
the gig. And uh, but it it was that was really thing. cool of him. That's like not yeah. con- consistent with a lot of the stories you hear. Yeah, he's nuts, and he smelled like a uh, you know like a Jack Daniels uh, brewery <laughs> or whatever you know distillery or whatever. But he was uh, he's he's up and down, man. That guy was so funny. It's one gig. <laughs> I'm just talking about this shit, I can't believe it. Anyway, we played this gig and. Uh, Kentucky at the fairgrounds in Knoxville, or no, I'm not Kentucky, sorry, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And he, I saw him get off this, put his guitar down, get off the stage, and run towards the fence line. And there's like a street over there, and this little bitty truck pulls up, and he jumped over the fence, and he jumps in the back of this truck, and it just takes off. <laughs> <laughs> like in the middle of the show? No, like at the end, at the very end of the show. It was almost like he had this guy waiting for him, and, uh, and he just like. And he leaves his running. gold top on stage. Yeah, yeah. It was a three thirty-five at the time, and he put it down. He like runs off the stage and runs towards the fence line. I go, what is he doing? And he jumps over the fence, and this guy pulls up, just stops, and he just jumps in the back of this truck. Oh takes wow! Off. It was crazy. Anyways, he's probably going to the gym. Yeah, I think, he was all, I think he was missing for two weeks until the next leg of the tour started. Yeah, he but, was probably uh, just going to the gym. He needed to get a workout in with his workout yeah, but, partner. <laughs> but what, one of the interesting things that I learned is uh, Mark's music is very, uh, some of it's like real funky and kind of fast. And we were playing these big sheds, and um, I was always talking to the sound man. I go, well, how's it sound, you know? And he, he'd kind of go, because, man, you know, he, you need to come out here like when I'm mixing the brothers and I'll, you know, talk to you and stuff. And so I went out there and, uh, he goes, man, the thing about it is when you're playing a big place like this, it's it the slower, like if you play a little bit slower, the music has a little time to reach, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. Like, like it's like a wave, like they would, they would play stuff slower like the brothers would. I mean, you know, it's like, and it created this thing, you know, the power was still there, but it was like, um, he said that'll have a little bit more of an impact on the, on the, you know, the crowd and stuff, you know, like, and I, so I kind of took that lesson with me and, uh, use it, uh, occasionally in certain situations, you know, so. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Or try to try to get the drummer to slow down and stuff. And cause some rooms and some places just don't have. They they just it's so reflective and there's all this crap going on and it's just kind of bouncing off the walls and stuff and uh, uh, who was I playing I, I went and saw Aldi Miola so here we are on a tangent no it's all good uh, man anyway but uh, we're playing he's playing this place in Houston called the Satellite Lounge and it's like a garage and he's doing all this stuff by the with the acoustic and had all this percussionists and stuff and and after the first song he goes I want to invite everybody onto the stage and sit just sit pick, pick a place and just sit down everybody come up front and they played real super quiet and you could hear like everything it wasn't bouncing all over the place and stuff so, so he obviously kind of, knew that yeah yeah, yeah. he just he, he felt it in the first song he was going this place sucks you know it's like it sounds like shit so that was kind of a, an interesting thing i've learned over the years is, uh, uh listening to the room you know what that reflection is and and uh that sort of thing. Anyway, it's kind of an acoustic thing, yeah. Now, when you were playing with the brother, when you were opening for the brothers, was was Jack Pearson the other guitar player or was Warren? Yeah. Jack, okay. Jack, yes. And he, so unassumingly, just come out and just kill everybody oh, no. every night. It's like, it's, I mean, he's like playing lines on the slide, like like he was playing single notes, yeah. you know, and it was, oh, dude, he was unbelievable. Uh, he's incredible. Yeah, you know what? It's interesting because I've interviewed Jack and I interviewed tons of people in Nashville, and um, Jack's the guy. Where everybody said, you know, you go to Nashville, say, "Oh, I saw this guy play. I saw this guy play," and then everybody's like, "But did you see Jack Pearson play?" Yeah, yeah. You know, he's like the standard of uh, ultimate musicianship for like everybody in Nashville, which yeah. is one of the yeah. you know most competitive music towns in the world. So yeah, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, but yeah, he's yeah. Great, great, great player. You know why he had to leave them? He actually, um, he had started having hearing trouble. Huh. And he said it was just horrible, but he goes, look, I'm on stage with Dickie Betts, and he has three 100-watt Marshalls cranked to 11 every night. And I was yep. liter- literally like, you know, 
it was killing him. So he said, I, yeah. I you know, so, um, what is it? Tra- yeah. yeah. It, we, it was interesting you say that. I remember we were, uh, we were somewhere in like Austin or something and we were there for the sound check and he, uh, their tech let us play through <laughs> Dickie's rig and he had like he has like these you know 412 boxes loaded with his JBLs you know <laughs> and, and they're just it's like they're not forgiving at all and it was like it was like somebody it was like getting run into by a car or something yeah. it's just unbelievable it's so loud man it just didn't didn't sound good to me but he made it sound great you know? oh so, he, he, tremendous yeah. player but yeah that's what Jack said yeah. he said I just you know yeah. I, I'm not going to tell Dickie Betts you got to turn down you know yeah exactly it, it is what yeah. it is but yeah that right was on, it, interesting. Um, same thing with Pat Travers. How did that slot open up? How did you guys connect? And and um, um, you have any cool stories from that experience? Yeah, um, I I knew his rhythm section at the time. Uh, Eric uh, Freitas and uh, Rick Navarro, and they got me in there somehow. And um, I played a gig with him on an Ormond Beach or something, and he was like. He goes, man, I really like what you did, you know, but I, I can't really afford another guitar player right now, you know. Because he was doing, like, pickup band stuff, Pat was. He was mm. he had Eric and Rick kind of for Florida and uh, East Coast, and then he had a, a West Coast band and a Midwest band and all that stuff. So uh, I got a call a couple years after that, about three years after that, and – um the manager he had just signed a management deal with this guy who managed the doors the doors 2000 or whatever that was remember? Yeah. with ian asbury and, yes uh, and uh yeah, yes yeah. okay yeah yeah so they they were doing shows with the doors vanilla fudge uh somebody else and travers dude those yeah. are some blast from the past names yeah, no, yeah <laughs> vanilla man, fudge and the doors yeah yeah but you know it's the whole carmine connection and all that stuff and, yeah but uh anyway so they like tom the manager wanted to go back to the old sound like the like with the two guitars have another guitar player who could you know support pat and bring it that instead of it being a three-piece thing and so that's where I came in, and uh, I went and did the audition and stuff. And he he said he liked what he heard, and it just kind of it just snowballed from there. <laughs> that's pretty yeah. like you know impressive as far as like you know when Pat Travers remembers your playing from three years ago. I mean, yeah. that says a lot about your playing. He's not like from yeah. Slouch who who doesn't. No, no, he's incredible. That guy is um, it's it's amazing. I have a lot of respect for him, and uh, what a great great guitar player he is and um this i learned a lot of stuff from him that was one interesting story um we were at in fender at the custom shop and um and and john cruz had this uh this strat that had like 4.5 output pickups in it i mean really super low output and he's like man play this is awesome you're gonna love this so i'm playing it and i'm going it's like plink think you know kind of just not really getting any sound going i mean acoustically it sounded cool but like the 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 tone i was just trying to have, have a hard time you know playing it and then pat picked it up and it just came to life Interesting. He, yeah because and i and i put two and two together i went i said i go dude it was so much louder like when you played it and he goes man it's like the way that i attack it he goes because back in the day when we were coming up in the 70s you know like playing he goes we don't have all this stuff that just drives itself now i mean uh it's like you would have to play harder uh to get the sound the sound that you wanted out of it you know and uh, i i just equated it with that you know interesting and, and, and and actually you know hearing older guys play and the way they approach their instruments you know drummers and bass players and stuff that i met through pat you know, it was like, it was kind of like this thing. It was like massive sound, you know, you know, and you'd notice it, you know, from guy to guy, you know, when I like, say Carmine would sit in with us in New York and, uh, he's it's a, like, I just, I just get loud as shit, man. It was unbelievable. It's like a force field behind you, like a wave of sound. And, and then same thing with Mars Cowling, you know, God rest his soul. 
he'd sit in with us and it just got loud. It's like just because his hands and his attack, you know. Interesting, man. Yeah, yeah. Right. Anyway, so anyway, no, that's a, hole, once again. Anyway. No, no, that's a good lesson. So basically, you know, these guys are looking before they had all this extra technolo- technology, they were just, they took responsibility. Hey, it's in my hands. I yeah. need to attack harder. I need to attack with more passion to get the right. volume I need. Right, exactly. That's, that's kind of how I, I, I started. I kind of noticed the thread, the little, uh, you know, connection there uh, yeah. with some of these guys. But, but what, it was a great experience. We played a lot of really cool shows with Pat and um, did a lot of really crazy stuff like, be on tour in Europe and then fly to Mexico and play a festival in Mexico and fly back to Europe. <laughs> how, how are the audiences in, in Europe different from here? Uh, they are, I tell you what, in the UK, they, they love him and he's like, cause that's kind of where he got started. Okay. I didn't uh, know that. He was, he was from Canada. He moved to the UK and, uh, within, you know, eight months he had, you know, a bunch of record companies trying to get him to sign and stuff. And, and so he kind of cut his teeth in the UK, and uh, and and like in Germany and stuff, you know, it, they want more like the blues stuff. They like, you know, they they tend to like that more, you know, like CC Top ish sounding, you know, shuffles, hard rock mm. shuffles, and you know, just really. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's really weird. I mean, they they have like a totally different thing. And Pat's music's kind of intricate in a lot of ways. There's oh, a lot of yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on there, and you know that some of that stuff didn't fly over too well, like in in Germany and stuff. But I mean, uh, but we always win them over, so it's good. Yeah. You know what? That's interesting. I just thought about. It. Remember that show they have in Germany, Rock Palace? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if you think about it, most of if you know, I never really put this together, but if you think about it, m- they had everybody on them. Most of the people were blues based. Yep. If you think about it, so that kind of makes yeah. sense. And even yeah. you look at a band like the Scorpions that came out of Germany, yeah. all their early stuff was pentatonic blues based, even right, though it was right. hard rock slash, not really metal, but hard rock back in the day. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, a lot of guys don't uh, understand. You know that it all came from somewhere. You yeah, know? and it's really the blues thing is. It's what started it all, and it's like a lot, a lot of guys. I mean, not to sound generic or anything, but it's no, like, it is what it is. But a lot of guys don't understand that that connection, and they just they they go and they just see a guy shredding, and they go, "Well, that came from somewhere. It had to come." You know, it kind of went. You know, if you go backwards, you trace backwards. It always leads back to you know Hendrix and Clapton yeah. and Chuck Berry and Muddy Waters and yeah. all that stuff. So yeah. It's funny you mentioned Muddy. I have Muddy's guitar player coming on the show like this week, uh, Bob Margolin. Oh, wow. Yeah, he talk about a guy who's had a ton of experience. I mean, just a real interesting career. I mean, it's so cool that I, I get to talk, you know, like I was talking to a guy from Nashville this morning to you, and I got Bob coming on tomorrow. So it's really... Oh, man, that's it, so cool. Yeah, it's really been a cool experience having all this diversity. It's incredible. Hey, let's talk about the Box Masters because I know you're excited about that and you're working on now. How did you get hooked up with... Um, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but how did, tell the story about that and and what's that been like for you? Um, I was had been playing with Pat, you know, for the time, it, and uh, we were kind of coming up on our ten year anniversary, and I was looking at the books, and you know, it was just sometimes you have holes in the schedule, sure, and uh, and there seemed to be there wasn't very many shows coming up and stuff, and it, and we were kind of. And not to sound like negative or anything, but it just felt like we had kind of like exhausted the whole thing a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I totally uh, get it. Like, like our, um, okay, well, we did, you know, this many records together, and I was just kind of like, well, now we're just playing. You know, we're not trying to create anything new. We're not trying to uh, go to the next level or anything or have the, you know, put together a plan to go to the next level because that's the thing. Uh, a lot of people don't understand it. you can have all the talent in the world but if you don't have all the stuff behind you mm. you can't you can't you know you're not going to be able to do it because there, it takes a business sense as well sure. to do this but anyway but you know 
here I go again. <laughs> Dude, you're not you're not anywhere near as bad as you think you are. This is all very interesting stuff. I mean, you're talking about relevant yeah. stuff. Hey, Lee, yeah. if I'll, let me, I'll if you're wearing a stray, I'll tell you. But you're you're totally cool, man. This is interesting stuff. Okay, for sure. cool. Promise. Awesome. Good, good. Yeah. Well, anyway, he uh, we had kind of uh, I knew that we kind of had that exhausted it, and it was kind of um, I mean the band sounded great. And stuff, but you could kind of tell there was kind of like this, you know, like, oh, you know, just getting worn out. And so I got a phone call the day after that last show that, that I was like, um, that we weren't going to have any work for like a month, you know, or we, there was just like two or three shows or something, you know, and it was, uh, but I got a phone call from my buddy who's the bass player, uh, road manager for the Box Masters and, and he said, man, he goes, we're, we're in a pinch, man. We need somebody. And I go, I go, I'll do it, you know, without hesitation. Just like, yeah, I want to do it. Because I was watching them on Facebook, man. They're opening up for ZZ Top and all this cool stuff. And and I was like, man, that, that looks like a lot of fun, you know, wearing suits and stuff, you know. Right, right. And it's kind of neat, you know. And so I, I got into that, and um, it was cool meeting Billy Bob. He's a great guy, really talented, very uh uh, he's a great producer and um just a great guys to be around you know and uh we played like the grand Ole opry and stuff which was kind of a neat thing you know i mean a lot of people want to do that their whole life and yeah it was like i was like oh, we're playing in nashville okay where are we playing grand Ole opry I was like uh oh, holy crap yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh i did a few records with them flew out to la and um and still doing some stuff with him here and there as far as that goes. And also, uh, we got, you know, he, you know, he's making movies in between. So, you know, yeah. it leaves me a lot of time to kind of do my other things, you know, pursue my own interests and that sort of thing. So, so it's worked but out yeah, well. It's worked out great. I love it. And it's a, it's a class situation. You know, it's like, you know, it's a, a good touring situation and, you know, there's like a bus and you got roadies and people set up your gear and all mm. that stuff. And, you know, what a concept. <laughs> it's like, it's like, is this happening? Yes, it is. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, cool, very, man. Very cool. You're, you're originally from, from Pasadena, Texas. What was, what was your childhood like? It was great. I mean, I was, I was the youngest, so of course it's always great for the youngest. Youngest um, of what? How many? Three. Oh, cool. Yeah, my brother, I have an older brother, and then the, Christy's in the middle, my sister, mm -hmm. and... um and you know it's good being around them too because they uh, they were very musically inclined, and uh, my sister was a, a great sight reader on the piano. She wow, really good. And uh, my brother kind of actually introduced me to the guitar thing. You know, he you know started showing me how to play guitar songs on the guitar, and he had bought like a Strat and um, and he had a quad reverb. <laughs> it's crazy. Wow. It was loud as shit, just, you know, JBLs, again, it was, like, just crazy. But uh, kind of got into into that, and mowed some lawns and bought a guitar, and and uh, then it just kind of snowballed from there. But, um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great place to grow up, man. It was a lot of fun. We had great neighbors. We had, uh, it was, it seemed like people were having a lot more fun back then, you know, so. But they had less options to be miserable, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> you know, they had to yeah. actually do shit instead of like, a, you know, sit on on this phone here and yeah, you yeah, know yeah. get absorbed in what yeah. the guy across the street is voting for or something like that, or right. you know what favorite products he or she likes or dislikes. I know. Um, well, that's that's the thing. I get you know, it seems like we've traded uh, convenience for. Um, Misery. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like it's terrible, man. I mean, yeah. it really is. It's like, and so I try to limit my time on it. You know, I try to, but it seems like people get real. You know, if you don't answer right away, you know, it's like. No, I because yeah, yeah. we're on. You're really good because you like put positive comments on there sometimes, yeah. and like I never see you write, and I would never take my time writing negative shit on there or, or uh, uh, giving opinions on there because no one. Yeah. I just assume no one gives a shit about my opinions, including me. Really, I mean. Yeah. And uh, what is an it's opinion? Just an opinion. Yeah. It's okay. Just, yeah. Next, you know, I got more it, important fish to fry. It, it's funny to me because people in there, and I'm not. I don't want to like rant or anything, but it seems like. 
people put stuff on there to shock or something. It's like, it's like, what do you have to gain by that? Yeah, I just no. don't understand it. It's like, it's like, you're not helping anything. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just the, the taking away, sucking out energy from the yeah. world, man. No, I, I I'm agree. totally with you, man. That's why, like, I see your stuff on there. You're like, oh, this guy's pretty normal. You can see, like, you're trying to go out of the way to, like, you know, try to be a little bit of a ray of sunshine and, yeah. you know, um, What's that famous quote? I think Thoreau, all men lead lives of quiet consternation, but on Facebook, they live them not so quietly, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, know. It's crazy, but, um, it, I, and I used to be, I look at the memories and I used to just say stuff, you know, because on the road, I'd get so bored. You yeah. Know, and I just like, well, I post like multiple posts of stuff and I'm going, man, I've, I totally don't do that now. Oh, that's <laughs> it's like, good. That's really yeah, good. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah. You know what I think would be hard? Um, and I'm sure this happens. Like, if you have a relationship and the two people are socially not compatible or, or social media incompatible. Yeah. Because, like, my wife, neither one of us post personal shit on there. But, like, yeah. like, I have some family members and, like, they're, like, constantly posting. I'm like, oh, my God, I couldn't be married to that person because, I mean, yeah. we'd have a serious problem. Yeah, it's terrible. It's just, yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's just weird. It's like everything's out there now, and uh, you know I, I, that's the thing that again, kind of bothers me. Is like it's, I'll get not like I'm big deal or famous or anything, but every now and then you get people come up to you and they go, "Yeah, when you posted about this and this and that or whatever," it's like they know me. It's like you don't know me. You know, people like, say you know, really they remember yeah, you. that's kind of yeah. uh creepy to be honest with you oh uh, yeah that's just the tip of the iceberg you know? really <laughs> yeah yeah holy oh, yeah. smokes that's really weird yeah, wow it's not, yeah it's, yeah it's gotten pretty ugly at certain points but uh wow anyway that's that's all that's the the uh, crime investigation uh segment yeah yeah <laughs> hey when you first started playing professionally what were like some of the bigger surprises for you about the music business you made a comment earlier about hey you got to know the business end to do this but what were the things that like oh it's like this kind of don't necessarily have to be bad things but just things that were surprising to you uh man that's a good question there's a it was always you know it's like a learning curve or just some kind of, uh, I just kind of, I remember this one thing, one of my first road gigs I went on, and we went to Vicksburg, Mississippi. I was with this band, and uh, we got there, and we were a variety band, and in the newspaper, there's a full-page ad that says, Live Country Band from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went... Holy shit. And like the, the bass player goes, I know a bunch of country songs. Here he goes, here's a bunch of cassettes. Here, learn them quick. You know, oh. today, you know, tonight. You have like tonight and tomorrow. And, uh, it, just stuff like that, you know, just being on the spot, having to learn things real quick backstage or, you know, that sort of thing. But I mean, I don't know. The, the business is, it's so weird now anyway. You know, I mean, it's like you, you it's like you have to, do everything yourself pretty much yeah you really you really do and it, there's no there's no support anymore and uh like that stuff is gone you know so yeah it's a different different landscape and that's why you know people don't they're not giving uh bands time to develop yeah you know? like uh it's like they want a surefire thing coming out of the gate it's like you're killing it because of that. You know, you're not letting these guys do their thing and be creative, you know, take a chance, you know. Well, the problem is when they say surefire thing, the definition of surefire thing means X amount of fans on Facebook, social media, whatever. Yeah. And money, you know, like yeah. making, you know, selling. And, and then I'm hearing about these, I guess they're called 360 deals. What is that? Some, uh, where the company, the label wants like a piece of your merch and a bunch of other stuff, you know. Really you know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's really that I don't know the ins and outs of it, but it's like it's, you know, they just want to suck everything they can out of you, you know, and uh, it's almost you're, you're better off just do, get, doing it organically and going to build your own thing and keeping in, in touch with your people yourself. You That's, well, you do a pretty good job of that. Yeah. Oh, you know, like I, I, yeah. No, I mean, considering you didn't grow up, you know, like my kids. 
I have two, three kids, 28 and 26, and I have an 18 year old. So the 28 year old will come to me and say, Hey, you know, I'm not like my daughter, Sam, because she, I learned how to talk to people. I'm really glad. Whereas, you know, when she's here with her friends, you got four people in the room sitting on the phone talking to other people. But so considering you didn't like grow up with that, that social media, you do a pretty good job of like, you know, you put clips of yourself on there and, and it's not yeah. easy because it's not, you know, you got to go out of your way to get all that shit done. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it takes time and effort. Someone else film you, upload it, all that's it's it's you got to be like be deliberate about it. Yeah. A lot of people, some of a lot of those clips are just stuff that people, other people film and I just share it and then it just kind of snowballs, you know, or whatever. So that's kind of the way I do it. But I like to sit down and film stuff it's a little awkward for me but I, i've done it a little bit like mm. on my youtube youtube channel sure like that. so yeah yeah but you got to be doing it yourself though you're right it's totally yeah right. yeah yeah because it's like oh you're on the spot you got to do it now you know? kind yeah of and it, okay let me get out my camera and my stand you know yeah where do you yeah. do all this stuff from it's not it's work yeah, yeah it is Kurt, well, if, cool. yeah. if you could go back, because you've been doing this a while, and give your give advice to your younger self, what advice would you have given yourself? Um, uh, to, to stay the course of, of what excites you. It was, it's nice to do a lot of different things musically, but sometimes you, know, you commit to something that's maybe not your – that's not really – you know, you're just doing it for the money, you know, it's like, you know, maybe take a little bit more of a, of a chance with that instead of just being, you know, thinking, you know, it's always a balancing act anyway, you know, Mm. trying to work, you know, and stuff. But uh, I would say that I would say, you know, uh, you know, find a way to do it, you know, and, um, and, you know, don't, it's not always, uh, you know, greener on the other side (laughs) a lot of times, you know, like really, and, uh, you know, especially like in terms of like new gear and that sort of thing, too. You know, everybody tells you, everybody tells you, you know, hey, man, you, you need to get this, you know, or you need to get this guitar. You need to get this rig. I remember I went and bought a, one of those big racks and stuff, you know, <laughs> back in the 80s. Mm. And it was like, man, it was like it t- totally I was like fighting that thing like all the time. But that's just a small thing. But uh, just stay the course. Find find what's what excites you and um instead of it you know always trying to you know um you know just work with different situations and it, sometimes that'll kill your soul man you know like yeah. we're working with a bunch of stuff that's like really not you you know if it's here and there it's one thing but like all the time you know it could be um that's that's one thing you know i I can't really think of anything else at the moment (laughs) no that's a great lesson i think that's a really good lesson yeah let's talk gear for a few minutes what's your go-to guitar right now and what other two guitars would round out your top three i got uh paul reed smith uh modern eagle that i play a lot uh and it's real versatile it's a very versatile guitar i have a custom shop strat that i love and um, it's everybody seems to like that guitar for some reason. Um, what I is mean, it? I, lo- talk, I love it. Talk yeah. about it, the Strat. What, uh, what, what is it? A reissue of what year? It's a reissue of a 1960. Oh wow! Uh, uh, Jumbo frets, uh, DiMarzio uh, area pickups, and um, I put a brass block in there, and that seemed to help. John Cruz suggested that. So I did that, and um, it just has a thing, man. People really like it. It's kind of a – the thing about it's cool about a Strat is uh, it's, they're so raw, you know, and uh, it kind of got this uh, this voice quality to it. You know, it's really – like when you hit it harder, you know, it kind of screams more and that sort of thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of this really weird thing. I mean, it's not it's not for every style of music, you know, but I mean I find that when I pick up my strat I'm I really start creating a lot more. Hmm. Uh yeah, it's just it's, there's something real creative about it. But uh, that those two guitars and I have an S G uh a sixty one reissue S G and it's I love it. Great, man. Those are great. Yeah. The nice thin I, I mean I have one of those too, it's a thin neck. I love it. It's- yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I've I've picked that up 
uh, last year, and it's like, man, this thing feels so good. Is that what the, does it have classic fifty sevens in it? Uh, it it does. It has like the old the old style. Yeah, thing. it's exactly the the same SG I have. Wow, I love yeah, that. Yeah. I, I can't play that enough. I, it feels so right. Everything about it, man. It's it's incredible, man. I mean, I've, and uh, a buddy of mine actually came to the gig the other night. He said, "Why are you playing an SG?" I go, "Well, pick it up." Yeah, oh, it's. And he was like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, yeah. like nothing. It's like picking up air, man. And it's I know, so. It's awesome. You got to get used to the neck being heavier than the. Yeah, yeah. But it's not like. But it, it feels so good. And it's a tone monster, that thing, man. Yeah, it's incredible. But uh, that. And then I've got. Uh, man, I've been using this amp made by Joe Naylor. Hmm. Um, like back in the 90s. It's, well, it's called Naylor by chance. Anyway. Where but, are they um, out of? Where is he out of? Uh, it was in Detroit, I think, okay. or somewhere in Michigan, somewhere. And um, yeah, the nailer seems to work really well. My go-to amp, and uh, I play that a lot, and uh, it, it sounds real good. It's like a JTM forty-five circuit. Awesome. And um, very cool. And um, that's been my main amp. And then I'll, I'll have like a Black Star, like an artisan that has. Um, you know, it's got like the uh, 100 watt to 50 to, <laughs> and all that stuff. And it's just like you just blow people's faces off of that thing. <laughs> when do you, it's terrible. What do you use yeah. on the the the, uh, the the Billy tour with the box um, monsters? We have uh, Vox AC30s. I run two of them in stereo. Wow. And uh, Yeah. And um, it's like a whole vibe. You know, he's got these um, two full stacks on each side of the stage. And, um, I use that and, uh, like, a, you know, a delay and a couple of, um, overdrive pedals and stuff on the front end of it, you know, and, and that's pretty much it, you know? So you, musically, if I asked you to pick your top three desert Island discs in no particular order and knowing this can change tomorrow, what would be the first three albums that come to mind? Well, my first record I ever owned was uh, Abbey Road oh, yeah. by the Beatles. So I'd probably take that and uh, Rush, Hemispheres. I love that album. That was Great my album. first, like, prog, you know, really. I mean, I was into Yes and stuff like that, too. But uh, that and then Pat Travers Live, Go For What You Know. That's a great record. That is a smoking ass record. <laughs> Go for and, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He told me about that. He goes, he said, yeah, that while I was recording, I think he said while he was recording Heat in the Street, they were mixing that in the other room. Wow. And he said, he goes, they, they were like, hey, you need to come come listen to this or whatever. And he'd go in there for a minute. He goes, I don't want to listen to it. You know, <laughs> it's like he didn't want to hear it, you know. And, uh, and it, it turned out to be a real big hit for him, you know. So, oh, I sure did. Yeah, that was what you know. That's when they were playing them on you know popular radios. So, sure, you know, that was crazy. That was back in the day when they would actually play sort of stuff like that. Now they don't really yeah. hear like maybe on deep cuts or some of the uh, serious stations you might hear something like that, but it's really hard to find. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can't find anything like that. Now. Yeah, like, unfortunately. Yeah, you have to dig harder. There's stuff out there that's that's real good, but it just seems I found that you just have to dig deeper to, and and now people. It's a weird thing too because people work so much that they don't have the time to go dig for all this shit. Oh, know? I know. And, and that's the thing; it's a weird deal. So then they resort to listen to the radio, and it's all has to be stuff that grabs people's attention. You yeah, know? immediately. And uh, I was just re- and this is kind of on the subject with that. Uh, I was reading a Billboard or something, uh, I guess, sometime last year, that radio stations were talking about that they wanted there to be less guitar solos in music. Really? Yeah. Why? Because it's they felt like it wasn't really uh, it was just kind of like it was like burning up time and people's attention spans were getting so short that they feel like it's like it's like it just kind of goes over people that don't really 
care about guitar shit. Wow. But know? that being said, radio stations are on the decline. So who knows yeah, if that's exactly. accurate? You know, yeah. it's like, uh, yeah. That's like because, you know, the newspapers said something. Well, newspapers are kind of like, out, you know, dinosaurs. Nobody gets a newspaper anymore for the most part. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. L- yeah. Let me ask you this. If I gave you a magic wand and I said, you know, Kurt, you can make three wishes, what would be your three wishes? <laughs> three wishes. Continue to do what I'm doing and uh, kind of what I am doing and, uh, you know, um, have a studio I'd like to have a, a studio, like a mm-hmm. big, you know, big studio in the house, and then have uh, something that was touring, you know, uh, and playing exactly what I wanted to play. You know, which is what? What? Because you, you're a pretty diverse guy. What? What do you yeah, like? Man, I tell you what, it's weird because I mean, I sit down and play, and it kind of, you know, it's kind of this blues rock, you know, thing. It kind of comes out, but I mean, I've got all these other things that I listen to, like classical music and stuff like that, and I. I would like to maybe delve into a little bit more of that, you know, too. So, like classical guitar or something? No, like classical, just just other instruments and stuff. Interesting. You know, I, can stuff, you play? Yeah. Other, can you play other instruments? No, I don't. But I just kind of hear them in my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so like, like putting just, something together where other people, like you're the run it, you're the leader, and other people are bringing the some of the instruments. Yeah, in. That's yeah. Interesting. Like, a, like, like a, I have a like a, a soft software scent and stuff and i and i do a lot of stuff with that and and just you know like composing with different means you know is, is a challenging but it's, it's also it can, keeps things refreshing too yeah as well so yeah that's very cool yeah 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 hey what's your best childhood memory oh man uh <laughs> i don't know if this is the best but it's pretty pretty funny uh and it has to do with what we're talking about. So I'm like, I'm at the house with my brother and all his friends are over there. And mom leaves the house to go do something. And they all run upstairs and hang uh, centerfolds on the wall. Like, you know, <laughs> like, like naked. And then they bring out these guitars and they put, they have a, uh, a, a guy breaks out this, thir- you know, thir- was it 35 millimeter camera? Like this is old with the film in it. Yeah, yeah. 38 or whatever it is. Oh, 35 millimeter. Oh, you mean a, a film camera? Like yeah, a yeah, video? Like a fil- yeah. Oh, uh, a video. It's oh, just a regular video. picture camera. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like 35 old, millimeter. Yeah. Like a, no, it was like a film. I would use like a little reel of film. Yeah. You know, like a thing. Yeah. <laughs> 35 and, millimeter. Um, and so I keep gets that out and they put on uh, uh, back in the USSR that's so Beatles, funny and did like a little video with all these naked chicks behind them and stuff and that I was is... just like I was just sitting there just like oh wow man this is cool <laughs> that's know, that was pretty like funny my, that was kind of like a, a rock rock and roll thing you know? yeah and yeah it's kind of neat you know do but, you still talk about that with your brother once in a while yeah I do every now and then that's funny and, uh, and he's like, oh, whatever, you know. But he he kind of got away from it. He he kind of got me into all this stuff, you mm. know. And then and then he just went off and did other stuff, you know. So, yeah, yeah. If uh, you didn't become a professional musician, what do you think you would have done instead? Uh, I'd probably be, uh, man, like a art teacher or something, or, or a real estate guy or something like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Those are pretty diverse. Yeah, it is because I, I studied art. I went, I was like really into art, like in high school and stuff. And I was actually showed some promise with that. And just kind of when I started getting into playing and stuff, I kind of left it alone. I kind of want to get back into it, you know. What kind of art? It's just like oil paintings and stuff like that. You know? Really? That's yeah, pretty, yeah. That's pretty complicated to stuff to do. Yeah, it is. It's real. And a lot of people go, oh, I like acrylics. You control them. I go, I like oils because you can't. And you can always change them. You know, they have like a weird, they have a weird texture to them. That's, yeah, that's really very, good. Yeah, yeah, very weird. It, yeah, I could, yeah, it's very, you have to be into the texture, I think, to enjoy oil painting. Yeah, yeah. That's a big part of it. Yeah, for sure, it's man. It's like kind of, it's so, it's like a clay on the canvas. Yeah. You know? okay, yeah, yeah. It's really weird. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, I like that stuff, man. I really, really, really dig it, and I uh, want to get back more into that stuff too. But I've been so consumed with this guitar thing, you know, for you know I, how long, you know. So yeah. Three more questions, Kurt. Um, okay. Do you have a non-musical superpower? Um, if I do, I feel like I really am into my whole thing that I, that I try to learn about is how human beings, how, what our true relation is with this whole experience. Um, I really, uh, I'm into like, uh, spiritual things, you know, like this guy, this guy named Ernest Holmes, who started the church of think of, of religious science and basically how, you know, what is it, you know, like, like I'm into like all that stuff, like the uh, frequencies and that's another thing too. Vibrations yeah. and stuff like that. Vibrational, yeah. for, vibrational things and, and how everything is frequency and how I was just <laughs> watching this thing the other day. This guy was talking about how if molecules are frequency and we're made and they make atoms, you know, or, you know, just kept going and then, then we are composed of that too, you mm-hmm. know? And so I'm kind of, kind of working on that superpower with that sort of thing. I'm really sure. into like how sound affects us, uh, how words, uh, and what people say affects people and, uh, not letting that affect you and that sort yeah. of thing. Um, you know, if somebody's got a problem with you, it's their problem. You yeah. Know, it's not 100%. your problem. You know, that sort of thing. So that's kind of my, my thing is, is to be more on the Zen level of, you know, our, 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 uh, relation to this experience and how we can make it better. Very so, cool, man. Yeah. 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 Um, and you might have answered so, any hobbies or interests outside of music. I know you're into art. Um, man, I used to be really like a wine guy, you know, like being, you know, this wine comes from here. And I, I, I don't drink that much anymore. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I was doing that and, um, kind of getting into that. And then I was into cigars and I had to quit smoking cause I got real sick. Oh, uh, wow. And, um, I, I got yeah. I it love was not cigars, fun. man. You know what? I do too. <laughs> yeah, they're good. But, but it's like uh, no. But if it's making you sick, obviously it's not. Yeah, yeah I got pneumonia, man. And, oh wow! And it was like you know, I, it was like you know, I'd like to breathe, you know. So yeah, kind of like important. Fun. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it was scary though. That scared the absolute shit out of me, man. Yeah, like, I would imagine. God, that's horrible. Like, you don't, I don't wish that on anybody. You, you know? don't hear people getting pneumonia too much anymore. I see a little bit of it. I think it's a lot of these guys, you know, like the, myself that thought that they could just keep, you know, mm. doing what they're doing, you know, like drinking and, and, uh, and smoking and, and all that stuff. And, uh, and it wasn't like you inhale the, 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 uh, you know, the smoke from sure. that. But if you're in the same room with it and, you know, you play smoky bars and stuff after a while. Oh, like it's kind of nasty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I go, when they x-rayed my lungs, and they go, how long have you had COPD? Oh, my God. That's pretty serious. And I go, I don't have COPD. I go, they go, your lungs look like you've been smoking since you were fucking, you know, like 12 or something, you know? Just from being in those environments. Yeah, I mean. Wow. You know, I just, yeah, that's really crazy. But I quit smoking and and uh, try to stay away from it as much as I can. Good for uh, you, man. You yeah, feeling better now? Yeah. Feel ten ten times better, man. Yeah. Great, well, awesome, yeah. Well, being in Florida awesome, probably right? helps that. Yeah. yeah, energy levels good here, uh, and the breathing thing here, the with that you know that ocean breeze and that sort of thing, it really helps. You know lot. what, man? The sunshine. Um, people don't realize this. Like, I went. My wife's in the UK. We went to England. I don't. It was quite a while ago. And the thing that was like, I was like, man, depressed because it wasn't sunny. Yeah. You really yeah. enjoy that sunshine. See if you just go out for a walk for ten minutes a day or something to get that sunshine, yeah. vitamin D. It makes you feel good, man. It does. It does. And uh, it's funny you mentioned the UK. I always enjoyed going over there and just visiting. I don't think I could live there. No, you know, I couldn't but, live uh, there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a nice place but to I, visit. Yeah, it is a very cool place to visit. But uh, but yeah, I love being here, and and I, I just have better days here physically. 
Good. Um, and so that's important, I think. You know? uh, yeah, very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Last question, brother. Uh, who's been the biggest influence on your life? Which person? Uh, man, I think my dad was a big influence on me. Uh, he was always real positive, uh, very supportive, and just it, just get excited about it, you know. And it, it kind of made me feel good. I mean, he wasn't that way for a long time, and then he, I guess, I came and saw me play and stuff, and it was like kind of a vicarious thing for him because his dad played too. His dad was a, a a musician as well. So interesting. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So yeah, my dad is awesome. He was a very positive guy and just. Well, was into like Norman Vincent Peale and sure and, power uh, of positive thinking, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. That's where I got it from. So that's, that's he, it. He's still around, your dad? No, he passed away in 2016. I'm sorry, man. Oh well, you know what? Hey, he left. The thing I always tell people, they like, go, oh, you know, my parents died or whatever. All that stuff stays with you. Mm. You know, it's like all those. Uh, it's almost like you can access them because you know what they'd say. Yeah, kind of yeah. Thing. And um, that's the thing that I, instead of being, you know, sad and, you know, down, and, oh, and it's just like, man, you got all these cool lessons and all these cool experiences. And mm -hmm. what a blessing to have been uh, them to be a part of your life, you know. Very much so, man. Yeah, yeah. Hey, listen, I, I really appreciate your time. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, I want to <laughs> just tell people where to find you. Um, it's Kirk McKim, M-C-K-I-M. Uh, he's a tremendous player. I mean, really versatile guy. And currently he's with the box masters. And when do y'all go out on the road? Uh, we go out, uh, I go to LA at the end of June, start rehearsals and we're going to be gone for two months. So through September. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's good. It'd be good. Come on out and check out the band. Yeah, absolutely. Support, support, hey. uh, uh, Kirk and the box masters and Billy Bob Thornton and see him on the road. And Kirk's also got a pretty cool YouTube channel. Check them out on there, and um, that's it, man. We, we wish you uh, well. I really appreciate your time and coming on the show, man. Man, I appreciate you taking the interest and even want to talk to me, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all good, man. I, I enjoyed it's it. Awesome. Um, me too. Everybody, listen, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did, and thanks again to Kirk McKim for spending time and sharing the story with us. Everybody, go to everyonelovesguitar.com, sign up to get notified of future episodes and get on our newsletter list. And remember, this is important. Happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice. Oh. Yeah, man, right? I dig that. Yeah, man. Old man. Happiness is a choice. So be nice, go play your guitar, and have some fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 